Let's get to the business news now with Nicholas Poynton. Uh, the Retirement Commissioner is, um, well, mulling over a complete shake-up of the sector. What does that mean? Yeah, complete the Commissioner's Officer rele- the Commissioner's officer Office, my God, I'm having a tough day, released a discussion <laughs> document on the Retirement Villages Act, which is about 17 years old. The paper looks at the current framework of the sector, identifies some issues, and puts forward some possible remedies. And some of the things that it's calling for a review on are the buy back and resell of units, how that's done, and also with the capital gains that a unit accrues over a time while someone is inhabiting it, whether those should be shared between the operator and the person's estate. So, you know, quite some dr- dr- drastic changes there if, if they were to ever come into force. So you're talking about, just to be clear, when people buy a unit in a retirement village, often um, when they die, they get, in essence, a, a, a refund, but not the value that's added on top of it. Exactly. So it's whether or not you know the estate, whether or not they would get some slice of the capital gains because these units, they do increase in price depending on when you do buy them. And Jane writes, and that's the retirement commissioner, she says the current commercial model of the sector, that needs to change. She says traditionally the way people get into retirement villages, they they sell their house, they use some of that money to buy a unit and then they use the rest of the money, they use that to live off. But that's likely to change given the fact that we're seeing decline declining rates of home ownership, the potential impacts of COVID-19 and other various matters like relating to people's financial health, that suggests that this model might not be able to continue into the future. Unfortunately, she has no solutions when I asked her about that. She just reaffirmed that this was a discussion document. It's all about getting the wheels moving. Unsurprisingly, though, the Retirement Villages Association, they're opposed to the suggestions and the calls for a review of the sector. They say the regulatory, uh, they say that, well, yes, there are some minor things on the fringes that that could be improved, but that's true of all sectors. And they say that the current regulatory framework that governs it is world leading and they are already sufficient safeguards in place. And they believe that the, you know, with regard to these concerns about the commercial model of the sector, they say that the free market, that will look after that. You know, government regulators, they shouldn't be intervening or getting involved. So the submissions on this will close on February 26. The Retirement Villages Association, they're yet to make their formal submission. But if you are interested, you can visit the Commission for Financial Capabilities website. And on this, three of the big uh, retirement village operators that are listed on our NZX, three of them saw their share price fall by nearly close to a percent today. Okay. Westpac Bank has revealed how exposed it is to climate change. Yeah, the bank has released its first climate risk report and it comes on the heel of that significant MB report we had yesterday which found that insurance premiums could increase fivefold for properties in low-lying areas due to sea level rise, severe climate events, we'll just call it climate change, and worse still, some properties could be refused insurance in the next 20 years. I know one of our reporters was chasing comments from the banks yesterday as they were pulling a story together. Mm. The banks were being very forthcoming, but thankfully we've had this report today from Westpac and it shows that up to 3% of the bank's lending was at risks to climate change. And that's in its residential and business and agriculture, uh, those those particularly those areas of lending and in money terms, Westpac yep. has about eighty-eight billion dollars in net loans for the year to September, and in terms of so that means about two and a half billion dollars of its debts are classified as risky. And Westpac's general manager expects some properties in the future will become uninsurable, and many people will face increased insurance premiums. And if people can't buy or get insurance, people will have to default on their loans, and it will be the banks that we're the losses. So the ramifications of this are potentially huge, but it wouldn't be surprising to see sometime in the not-too-distant future that banks will stop lending to particular parts of the country we may, have a, we may have a situation where there'll be these beautiful wastelands or beautiful parts of the country that will become uninhabitable wastelands because no one can get a mortgage or get insurance to live there. But Westpac says... In response to this report they put out today, they say it's increasing its proportion of lending to climate change solutions. I don't really know what that means. But they say it's reducing its lending to fossil fuel industries and it stopped lending to coal mining altogether. And those are big numbers, but that's just one bank. So the big picture. just one bank. Yeah, interesting. Okay, tell us what's been going on in the markets today, Nicholas. Our NZX closed up, or closed down rather, 80 points to 12,649, possibly dragged down by those retirement uh, village operators. 
traders, the big players in the market. Our dollar is at 70.6 US cents, 95.3 Australian and 52.8 British pence. Thanks, Nicholas. Nicholas Poynton with Business News.